I'm going to give you four cases. I think it's a total of four that I want to kind of run down the list here. Tell me what you would do with this step. All right, Mike. First step. Yeah, probably uh, augment that one. Dome. Might repair it. You can't. It's uh, either augment or you can't repair it? Okay, augment yeah. it. Okay. John? Augmentation. Okay. So that was a recon. Again, there's no right or wrong. I think the quality addition, in my opinion, was just um, a little bit less uh, uh, than I liked. But um, all right, this one, Mike. I did reconstruction. Dome. Augment. John? Augmentation. Yeah, so um, this one, uh, I think it was uh, augmentation because of the the quality itself, in my opinion, again, I think the quality is there. It's just small volume. And so if you can maintain some of that native tissue and incorporate it into your graft, um, but like we saw earlier today in the, in the demo, I think that's uh, more uh, applicable to kind of condylable junction being maintained and uh, hopefully uh, providing some more stability to the hip. Um, again, there's no right or wrong here, but uh, this one, pretty, uh, yeah, recon pretty recon adverse. Yeah. Recon. Reconstruction. Yeah. So that's Recon City. And the last one. Probably augment that. Augment. Yeah. Augment. Augmentation. Yeah. So I, I think there's sort of some um, consistency um, along amongst the panelists, but I really think there's a lot of uh, variability that's going to exist when you get into the hip. There's no right or wrong here. Just um, you got to have be ready for anything because you may have consented for one thing or the other. Um, uh, but if you consent for everything, you have the potential to do anything you need to. So. Um, so, John, we're going to start with your case today, 27-year-old um, female who enjoys running. So, um, I kind of hit a couple slides, but I think I wanted to let you talk about this case and um, uh, present it to us uh, first. So, so she's a pretty normal, uh, regular, regular young athlete. She came in with three days of hip pain. She had been running that weekend in the race, and you know she had been training for five months to get to this marathon, and she comes in and she has deep hip pain. So these are her metrics. She's of normal body weight, reasonably at normal height. She has some tenderness anteriorly, see sign pain. You can see her range of motions within normal limits. So you're dealing with something not quite as crazy as we've seen some of these more extremely difficult cases. We're dealing with her metrics, with tonus angle, lateral center edge angle. You can see that Potentially, you could call this normal to potentially slightly a borderline dysplastic case. So just some literature on mild or borderline dysplasia, you know, remembering we've already had a couple sessions on it, remembering that there are definitely some variations in normal characteristics of male and female athletes. This, I think, may be some video to show the MRI scan. Yeah, potentially. Yep. So we're seeing just, uh, we're really looking at this case for stress fracture or avulsion or problem. She just got hurt during a race. She's only had three days of pain. We're ordering this for standard sports medicine metrics more so than we're looking at a fancy hip preservation metric. You know, she just ran, we see a labral tear, no stress fracture. So let me let me pause that. Yep. You, do, you do see a stress fracture. Say you saw one on the MRI, she's got a labral tear as well, came in with three days of pain on the half marathon. Right. Um, is What's your, um, I guess we'll kind of go down the line here, what's your first uh, management option for that? Is it crutches and, and sit tight for six weeks, yeah you do? Um, is that pretty standard for? For this kind of situation? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the degree of the stress fracture and the location. Obviously, um, the higher degree, you're going to probably be a little bit more aggressive of, of fixing it if it looks like it's truly grade four, if it's on the uh, uh, ten tension side. If sure. it's not, then yeah, six weeks, limited weight bearing, uh, and then, uh, you know, provided that she's got no symptoms afterwards, increased weight bearing. So, so she's 12 weeks now, still in pain, not as much as she was when she first presented to you, has a stress reaction on the MRI you're considering doing some operative management. Are you addressing the intraarticular pathology as well at the same time? Are you doing concomitant uh, hip pinning with arthroscopy? Anyone here? Yeah, I think it depends on what our exam's like. So if she's got a positive impingement sign as opposed to uh, standing pain, which would be more related to, in my, my view, the stress reaction. And if she's got both, then I would address both. If she has no impingement signs, a good range of motion, but pain with standing or pain with stress and on rotation, then I would probably just fix the uh, thermal stress fracture. Yeah, and I think that's hard because they're going to be painful. If they have a stress reaction, it's hard to really assess if the pain is coming from a labral tear or from the bone itself. And I, I don't think there, there's any utility in diagnostic injection because you can numb up the hip and you still are numbing up potentially two things. Um, uh, but Ben and John, it's, again, 12 weeks out, are you doing uh, concomitant cases? Or are you doing the bony work first and then coming back in the future if you have to, you think it's more bony first? I'll do both um, uh, if I can't sort out clearly which is the cause of the pain. Um, but I think just to pile on to that, um, uh, Mike's last point and take it kind of from the opposite angle, uh, 
more often what I see is I'm pretty sure they're, uh, they've got pain coming from an intraarticular source. They've got positive Im impingement, but I'm not sure if they still have pain coming from the stress fracture or not. Is it healed or is it not? I still see some edema on the MRI. You know, is that normal or is that um, uh, part of the uh, uh, continued stress fracture? So at that point, I, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna fix the labral tear by then, I'm probably also gonna put screws in uh, to act as a rebar for the stress fracture. Yeah, John, you're shaking your head same. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I, I wouldn't take any more time than that. I think that's exactly how we look at it. Maybe only add that we, we would do, as we did in this case, metabolic screenings in those athletes to be certain that if we're shutting them down, there's the right metabolics that are there to maybe aid in that healing, but 100%, you don't know, and we're not relying on MRI resolution of stress fracture. Yep. You know, so. Yeah, I just wanted to pause there because we haven't talked about that yet, but you're going to see them in your office and we're all thinking labor them, labor them, labor them today. Right. But you got to step back and think about what they're presenting with. Um, so we kind of sure, because I think that's definitely an important point. And we look at sort of our treatment decision and we're looking at, you know, labral tear with psoas bursitis. We, we did a six weeks graded return to weight bearing is tolerated in PT. Okay, so this was not an... And an opportunity to operate, reconstruct, or repair. This was a, this is a conservative management approach. This is sort of how we managed it. But we're looking really at labor repair, and I want to just you know give credit where it's due because you guys have some of the best publications out there. We have lots of evidence that labor repair works, thanks to many in this room, um, most notably Ben. And um, we can we can certainly still fix labrums in 2021, and and I would make a position that we should still. Be considering to fix labrums and you know there's many ways of doing labor repair we talked a little bit about it but but suffice it to say that the argument about what's missing behind that photo of a, of a labrum that's repaired would be any additive augmented material to either fill the space or push the labrum down which is is not to say that it is not valid to do an augmentation but i think it's it's important to note that in this particular case you know, this is tying, even tying knots, even in 21, we can do that with hip reduced, we can do it with the hip distracted. Um, there are a number of ways to manage the tensionability of a labral repair that produces an excellent seal. And when that, and when that occurs, I don't think that should be considered a failure, but rather that's the gold standard that everything should be not only uh, compared against, but the new, more expensive technology should be superior if both groups are doing well. And this is just something that we should push ourselves as a group to show where where we where we need to push this uh, more. Shows us how she did. So six months out, she's running. She had a simple two anchor repair. We have her IHOT scores pre and post and her satisfaction scores. Um, and this is, a, this is a case that hopefully demonstrates they really just want the doctor to fix their fix their problems. Yeah. That that was what I would figure would share. For yeah, and I think it's a great start to the to the, to the uh, session because, you know, that, that shows you the quality of the tissue was there. It was repairable. It was fixed, and she's doing fantastic. So not everything we're talking about kind of graphs um, uh, all day long, but really when you have a case that, that warrants a, a repair and a high quality one like like John did, it, it works out fantastic for the patient. We'll move over to Dome's case here. So uh, 19 year old soccer player, you want to go ahead? Sure. So this is a 19-year-old female uh, soccer player with hip pain for a year, anterior impingement, and painful external rotation, Baden's of zero. I think it's important about the Baden's of zero because this case is sort of polar opposite of, not polar opposite, but along the lines of uh, a different technique from what you previously presented on with a very similar uh, anatomy. So center edge angle uh, here, again, we're referencing off of a horizontal line. Uh, so subtract 90 from that and you get 25.8 as the center edge angle and alpha angle here um, is measured at 74. If you looked at that, you wouldn't think that's a huge cam, but when you measure it out, it's uh, 74 where we measured it to. And uh, here's our uh, MRI, and we can at least see a, a cleft in the chondrolabral junction on the coronal view on the left. So this is where I think it gets interesting. Very um, interesting. Thought, basically, you have a labrum uh, that is not in contact with the femoral head. Uh, and the question is, it's a very hypoplastic labrum. It's probably two millimeters and its native position is not in contact with the femoral head. It's hard for me to even say that it's torn, but it's ju it just was never in a position where it could confer stability on the uh, femoral head. So what do we do? Yeah, has anyone seen this in the OR? You, you, you get in there and there's nothing touching that head and you're reduced and it's not, there's no frank tearing. It's not subluxed uh, in the joint. So I'm sure you've seen it if you've been in the hip and. Um, it's a tough situation. Um, uh, Mike, we talked about this earlier. Um, thoughts on uh, repair versus augmentation versus recon, and how do you repair this? 
Yeah, I mean, I wish I would have seen these slides like three weeks ago. That would have been helpful. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's one of those where you get inside and, and same thing. Your expectation doesn't really meet what you're actually looking at. And when you have a separation between the native labrum, which is supposed to be creating stability and creating a seal and you don't have one, um, you know, it becomes a little bit of a daunting task. And I think in this case, you know, where you just don't have enough tissue, but you don't have a tear, do you need to really take down everything uh, to recreate that? And, and this is a situation where, yeah, I think considering doing an augmentation and, and just bulking up the labrum to push that native labrum down to uh, theoretically create a new seal uh, is definitely a good approach. I mean, alternatively, you could argue there's nothing there anyway. Want to remove any sort of pain generators that is associated with that, um, you know, the, the nociceptive fibers that are within that labrum and, and reconstruct it from front to back. Um, but, you know, without that, I mean, you clearly need something. Yeah. And there, there's even this described techniques of uh, doing a label detachment and um, uh, drilling on a condyl surface like a shoulder and, and actually doing a reposition procedure. Um, can any of the panelists speak to having done that in the past? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, first I would say that in situ label repair is, is, is a ridiculous decision in this particular case because you're just basically, you know, I don't even know what you would be thinking. But if you were talking about repositioned repair from, I think, I think Omer Maidan really popularized the Ogata angle and measuring this on an MRI scan and looking at that lateral rim of the acetabulum and trying to trying to use the MRI to maybe predict this. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that advancing it can work. I think that we've probably on the panel all, all tried that. I think it's still a little tiny bit of tissue, you know, so without resection, you know, I think this is where augmentation does become, you know, more interesting. I will say also that depending on the degree of flexion that you take your, your, your image, this may see you if you weren't, if you were in the audience and you haven't seen this, you may flex your hip some and move your hip underneath and let the dynamic exam expose these because they actually uh, occur more often, I think, than we, than we probably give credit to. Yeah, it's probably seen you. So, Ben, here's your um, diagnostic. And really, no, no opposition whatsoever. Right. So what I'm pointing out here is primarily that. And then when I applied distraction, there was no suction seal. So usually you apply traction and you apply, 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 and all of a sudden, poof, right? And you see a rush of fluid. That just doesn't happen here. It just gradually slides out. So what I thought was happening was happening that the absence of contact between the labrum and the femoral head was causing a hip that did not have a suction seal. So the idea behind the idea behind the seal uh, allowing that egress of fluid um, or preventing the egress of fluid um, is important. Here, there's no there's no rush, as you mentioned. There is no egress. Um, there's nothing there. So the, the, the surface tension is is what it is. Um, we want to provide a, a more of a uh, kind of closed uh, compartment there. So um, moving, moving to your um, your next portion here, this is what you did. So I, I preserved that labral remnant, but I fold, uh, rolled it together with the graft. So uh, it's almost hard to see the separation or the distinction between the graft and uh, the remnant of the labrum because that labrum was so small. So I, I guess you ask yourself the question, why bother preserving it at all? Uh, as opposed to just removing it and reconstructing the labrum and my thought process is what you're gaining is the preservation of the circumferential uh, longitudinal fibers, the hoop. Um, and you know, going back to what I apparently once eloquently said about the uh, labral seal, uh, the, the goal is to seal the ball in the socket and seal the lubricant fluid in the joint. And I think of this the same way as you think of the suction cup that sticks on the wall of your shower. Uh, it, you know, you pull it off the wall and it goes as you pull it off. But if you were to nick any one edge, just a little edge of it, it would no longer have that seal. Even though the whole rest of the hoop was still intact, the, the one disconnect would disrupt the whole seal. And um, at least at time zero, when we remove a labrum and put in a graft and reconstruct it, we're doing that. We're, we're creating a situation where the graft has to heal to the uh, native labrum or to the transverse acetabular ligament. Uh, and hopefully it does, but at time zero, you've got uh, essentially uh, a, a transition point that is a potential disruption in the hoop and hence the seal. So the, the theoretical advantage of an augmentation and preserving the hoop is that you're preserving uh, a better seal and adding robustness uh, to the tissue. Yeah, and if the quality of the tissue is there, just it's, it's diminutive and small, I, I would say that it's best to keep that, that junction intact. I mean, putting a, a reconstruction graft is, is needed when there's no quality tissue left behind. Um, but to, to the point just made, you're going from chondral surface to graft. 
that's the jump that's needing to be made. And at time zero, there's no scar formation yet. So um, potential leakage of fluid. This, this argument is only relevant in the era of primary reconstruction because the, the, the indication for reconstruction being revision segmental tissue loss was the way we got here. And, mm -hmm. and maybe if we can remember that we got here from excessive debridement or, mm -hmm. or segmental iatrogenic loss of labrum, which is where we were fixing that problem. And now we're talking about when we approach it to primarily take and change the native labral interface so we have a whole new, a new, whole new question versus, you know, versus the concept of is it in, in revision settings? Do we augment or do we, or do we repair or do we reconstruct? Yeah, I think Mike may have presented on that uh, earlier, but uh, uh, yeah, when the tissue has already been touched, in a revision setting, presumably the quality is less so than what it was uh, at its index procedure. So does that deserve to be augmented or reconstructed? That is now the new question. So then Mike will uh, go through your case here. Um, go ahead. Yeah, this is a 29 year old nurse, uh, had one prior scope, um, uh, two anchor repair, uh, capsule closure, still had pain, uh, several months afterwards, tried extensive yeah, PT injections, uh, was able to really get back to higher level activity and uh, most activity. You okay. see measurement, you know, a little bit of a cam, nothing major, um, maybe a little bit of kind of question with borderline, slight upsloping, uh, source on the right. Um, and then also just painful overall testing, um, in, in range, but no feeling of instability subjectively and importantly, beta score, you know, low one of nine. Uh, again, there are your numbers, 65 alpha and 23 uh, anterior center edge angle. MRI here, you can see there's a little bit of a diminutive labor, more anteriorly. Questionable if it's a re-tear or not, but again, as we talked about, MRIs, uh, post-surgery, a little bit tough. The capsule does have a little bit extra sort of uh, fill. You can see a little bit of patchiness there. Maybe there's a little bit of a capsule laxity as well. So here, here's intra photos of uh, right before uh, we decided to proceed with the, the next part of the case. Yeah, so I wanted to just pause here for a moment. So. Um, You've got a revision case. We talked about 3D CTs for all patients in all settings. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe not. Um, uh, I, I mean, you're, you're uh, obviously an open preservation surgeon um, uh, as well. So, what are your thoughts on um, prep CT for all revision cases um, to find anything that you were not expecting um, and potentially leading you toward uh, more of a bony correction for something uh, that has the borderline nature? Um, even in the revision setting? Yeah, I think definitely in the revision setting, uh, CTs help. Um, John Closey's group really just, just uh, described a really good low-dose protocol that really limits the amount of radiation um, that is exposed to patients. Um, I think for me, what really helps is that you get a really good understanding of the femoral version, acetabular version, and then what was done uh, preoperatively uh, or whatever surgery was done before. So I think it can be a little bit tough to identify that on uh, even multiple uh, x-ray series. Um, because you're not really seeing the, the full uh, three-dimensional view. I mean, I have a, a revision case that I'm looking at now. She's had four prior uh, surgeries, one including a PAO, and you, you can't see much. The, the correction looks good. Interest in her wall, wall looks good. Her CT scan shows that she's got a pretty big defect along the anterior kind of, you know, 12.30 to uh, 1 o'clock where all of her prior revision uh, scopes were done, and so she's missing a defect there. And so I think in those cases, it definitely helps. Uh, for non-revision cases, I think that I'm starting to consider adding that, uh, just given the fact that it is a low dose to help with pre-op planning and to assess in those cases that are a little bit more complex for version issues on either on the acetabular or femoral side. Yeah, I think I think those subtle losses of bone along the acetabular wall uh, is often can be missed on plain film. So it's, it's imperative, I think, in my opinion, getting that CT to make sure you don't have uh, that to walk into mm -hmm. in your case. So we ended up proceeding with a labor reconstruction here. Um, so earlier on, ended up using a different type of graft, but now we're using a tibet allograft, um, and then uh, did circumvention reconstruction here. Uh, and you can see the femoroplasty down below to address that uh, large uh, alpha angle. Yeah, so preserved condylabral junction. Um, really nice job with, with managing both the intraarticular, uh, central, and peripheral compartment uh, issues, uh, especially in the revision setting. I think in conclusion, um, you know, as we're wrapping up here for this particular session, uh, pre-op exam is key. Uh, we have a couple cases now where uh, some folks were borderline dysplastics and, and had a Baton score of nine. And we had a couple of cases where there were uh, zero or one. And that affects sort of the, the treatment algorithm. Uh, ben talked earlier about doing a concomitant PAO and arthroscopy for the patient who is uh, hypermobile uh, with a very similar uh, radiological profile as the one that was, he just presented where he did not do a PAO for that. Um, so. I think that matters, the apprehension matters, um, uh, the preoperative imaging we talked about, and um, the goals are reconstitute that seal. So we've talked now about the maintenance of the chondrolabral junction and the correcting the impingement and the stability, but understanding the stability uh, is important. What's destabilized? What needs to come back is critical here.